everyone, my name is Joy Owens and I am the Education Manager at the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee. Today we are celebrating World Elephant Day by talking with a few of our international partners from around the world. Through a generous bequest from the Mark Hopkins Shell Trust, the sanctuary collaborates with and supports international partners on four continents, Africa, Europe, Asia, and South America, with a focus on human elephant conflict, anti-poaching, habitat preservation, research and field work, rescue and rehabilitation, improved management and care in captivity, and veterinary care. Joining me now is Pete Copolillo of Working Dogs for Conservation. Thanks for talking with me today, Pete. Thanks for having me, Joy. Awesome. Well, uh, let's start off by you just telling us a little bit about what Working Dogs does, how you guys got started. Yeah, well, we were founded um, in 2000. Uh, four women, they're all biologists. Um, who wanted to find a better way to do primarily ecological monitoring, to get information about wildlife. And that was right on the heels of um, the 1990s when fecal DNA became possible. And so for a long time, we did a lot of counting, monitoring species just by finding their scats. Um, and so, you know, back then it was a heavy lift just to find out what species it was. Um, and nowadays we can find, you know, not only species, but what individual, who they're related to. We can get stress hormones, reproductive hormones, diet information. So we still do a lot of the SCAT and ecological monitoring work just because the lab techniques have gotten so good and less expensive. Um, but in the years since, um, we've, we've expanded to start working on invasive species like invasive weeds, um, noxious weeds, but also invasive um, mammals. <clears throat> And, um, and even in invertebrates like Argentine ants or zebra and quagga mussels, um, things like that, preventing their spread, but also mapping the infestations and helping eradicate them. But um, the, really the, the origin and our, a lot of our growth over the last number of years and the origin of our relationship with the elephant sanctuary has been uh, moving into law enforcement. So stopping wildlife crime is now a really big part of, of, of what we do. And really, quite honestly, elephants were the, you know, the thin end of the wedge for that. Um, in uh, 2012 and 13, we were working in Zambia and had a um, uh, lion, leopard, cheetah, wild dog ecological monitoring program in South Luangwa with Conservation South Luangwa. And um, they, they asked two questions. They said, Can, you know, this is great. It's nice to be able to count the carnivores, but we're in the midst of this awful poaching crisis for ivory and for snaring. And so, A, can you train dogs on snares? And that was a whole side project and we did it and it was successful. But the bigger one was, was ivory. And so um, then in 2000, by 2014, we actually had um, nine dogs on the ground in, in Zambia, um, stopping wildlife crime. And so now um, we've, we've got 14 dogs on the ground in Africa and um, we convene a larger network of over 200 um, dogs and handlers in 15 countries, most of whom work on ivory, rhino horn, and other trafficked um, sort of species. Um, so that's been a huge growth you know, area for us. And it's wonderful, it's, it's gratifying work because not only are the dogs good at interdiction when they're smuggling going on, but now with changes in technology, they're actually able to, um, to prevent poaching before it happens. Um, so it's, 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 it's been a great, growth area for us and great fun and very gratifying to see the impacts they have. Very cool. Um, so I would love for you to like elaborate a little bit more about how uh, the dog's work specifically helps elephants and like you said, actually helps to prevent poaching. So can you elaborate on that a little more? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in the beginning it was mostly we just trained on, on um, just ivory and then started training on other um, wildlife products and, and, and animal parts. Um, and so early on, it was, it was inspecting a lot of vehicles. So vehicles that would come and go from the protected area or from areas of the country where there was known poaching, they would do what's called a snap roadblock and they, you know, um, set it up and um, it either, either vehicles themselves or cargo in, you know, the vehicles. And one of the early finds, um, a very famous dog now named, named Ruger, who unfortunately has passed on, he's left us. But he, um, he was a, a lab shepherd mix. He was rescued from the Blackfeet Reservation here in Montana. One of his first early finds was at the back of a, of a, of a, um, a minibus, you know, the overloaded minibuses that have a lot. And he alerted at the back and they pulled all the suitcases off of the back and laid them out. And he alerted on a specific suitcase 
they unloaded the suitcase. They couldn't see any ivory. They couldn't see anything in the, in the um, suitcase itself. And so they unloaded the suitcase and laid it out. And in the pocket of a pair of pants, in a plastic bag was a matchbox. And inside the matchbox, also wrapped in plastic, was a primer cap, a single primer cap used for a muzzle loader to poach elephants. And so that was one of his first um, uh, ammunition finds. And um, since then, he, and what was really significant about that is, is that the poacher was arrested. They actually recovered the gun too. And when you, when you take a gun away in Africa, you're not only, that's not only the owner of that gun who can't poach with it, but they loan those guns out to other poachers because they're so hard to find and so hard to get. And these are not guns like we think of them. These are often homemade, brutal muzzle loaders. They'll, they'll load them with gravel and bits of iron and even pieces of wood. And they, they, you know, they just wound animals and they track them for days while they bleed to death. It's an awful practice. So um, Ruger, Ruger got dozens and dozens, eventually scores of, of guns. And each time he's putting seven or eight or even 10 poachers out of business. So that was a wonderful prevention, um, you know, activity that we just, we were, we were so proud of it. And, and his successors are still doing all of that work. The other very interesting piece of preventive work now comes from new technology. And those are, those are camera traps that can be, you know, you know like a trail camera or, mm -hmm. or, you know, and there are remote cameras that are placed out in the bush. And one of the things that was happening in Asia and, and in Africa is poachers would either see them out in the open. So they started hiding them, right? Making them harder to see. But the challenge is, you, you know, you go and you check the chip or the, you know, back in the day it was film, but um, you check the, the, the chip and you see poachers walking in, you see poachers walking out, but you haven't caught anybody. So there are new camera traps that um, will transmit their data to, back to wherever we, you, you plan to, which is, that's really cool. But then you're getting a hundred photos a night of a mongoose and a baboon and an impala and a, this and that. So um, some colleagues um, decided that they could put uh, an AI, an artificial intelligence chip in there to interpret what's in the image. And now it will only email or email or text or satellite phone, whatever, however it's programmed to do, depending on the environment, the, um, when it detects a human. So not only that, they are very small and very hard to find. <laughs> so um, it, they're really amazing. And, and poachers don't even know that they're hidden there. They don't know how it's happened. But again, there was a problem in that you get a photo and they alert the anti-poaching team and they scramble and they go. And sometimes they can get there as fast as 10 minutes, but the poachers moved on and they hear the truck coming or they, you know, they just hide, right? Well, that's a very difficult task for a ranger on foot to find that poacher, but it's a slam dunk for a dog. A dog on a 10, 10 minute old track is, you know, that's, that's child's play. It's very easy for them. So combining those cameras with dogs is a hugely powerful new tool. And um, it's just getting started. There are a handful of them out in, in Africa now, but you know, within the next year or two, we're gonna see lots and lots of those and lots of dogs catching lots of poachers before they ever make a kill. So um, it's wonderful. And the, the place where our dogs first encountered these were in Grimetti um, in, in Tanzania on the Western corridor of, of the Serengeti ecosystem there. And what's really significant about Grimetti for elephants is Grimetti occupies about 5% of the greater Serengeti ecosystem, but it has 20% of the elephants because the elephants know that they're safe there. And so um, they really, they're, they're piled in and they're, they're concentrated there. So we're really proud of that program. And I should say, there's also a lot of traditional boots on the ground, rangers and patrols going on there too. It's not only the dogs or only the cameras. They're doing a fabulous job, the Grimetti Fund. Um, so, um, but it's, it's wonderful to see. And, you know, I was just there last year and it's fabulous to see calm, mellow elephants who are you know, happy to have cars around. They don't, they don't run. Their temporal glands aren't running. They're just, yeah. they're calm with the calves and they're just happy. And it's just so wonderful to see. That's really awesome. So it sounds like a lot of things are working together. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, can you tell us um, kind of about a specific project that is supported by the Elephant Sanctuaries International Partner Program? Yeah, so our, um, our, our funding from the sanctuary for which we are hugely grateful um, both, both that it's very generous, but also that it goes on from year to year because this is a long-term, you know, a long-term 
um, endeavor. You know, we're going to have to keep going for a, for a long time. And, you know, rangers don't get to take a break. Um, so our, um, uh, the, the Elephant Sanctuary support um, goes to support specifically our uh, backstopping of the programs, our own dogs, the programs in Tanzania and Zambia, and to do outreach to help all of those, the, what we learn and what we find out um, and, and, you know, helping other programs that don't have the benefit of an international NGO like us or, or funding learn how to do similar work and keep high, you know, high quality work happening on the ground. So, you know, it's a lot of very basic stuff because dogs, there isn't a, a, a history, a big history of working dogs in Africa. And there are a lot of, um, so we have, to, we have to find people and teach them from the ground up. You know, this is what basic husbandry is about. And this is, a lot of it is really just keeping dogs healthy, keeping them working, keeping them well-trained. And, um, and that's hard because in a dog program, often, you know, they take, they take an individual dog handler or maybe two handlers and two dogs, and then they're kind of isolated, but they're part of a law enforcement team, right? So there isn't a ton of other dog expertise. So by linking them up, putting them in a, in a professional network with everybody, in, you know, from in, in very high level programs in like South Africa and, and Kenya and here in the States, and then brand new programs that people are like, who is this dog? What do I do with it now? You know? Um, and so they do, you know, they're on constantly on WhatsApp together and we share videos of training and, and methods and people say, hey, I have a pickup truck. How might, how should I modify it to carry the dogs? All sorts of stuff like that. So that really, it not only, it not only helps us to do the work and support um, those dogs on the ground, but to raise the bar for everybody else. So it's a, it's a big deal and, and, um, and it has a big impact everywhere. That's awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about like where you find your dogs and how uh, they come into the program? Yeah. Yeah, we're a little different than a lot of working dog, um, um, you know, programs, whether police or military or government agencies or whatever, in that we rescue our dogs. Um, and um, we made a commitment to do that um, in around 2010 to 2012, after uh, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and increased security in, um, for, for after post 9-11, um, there was a global shortage of detection dogs worldwide. And so that created two problems. One was that the price of a detection dog, a specialty bred, you know, bred detection dog, went over twenty-five thousand dollars. In some cases, you know, they were up, up around fifty, sixty thousand dollars per dog they were selling these dogs for. Um, most of them were coming from Europe, and so for us, a small NGO, that's you know, a prohibitively expensive. But b, the bigger problem was that because that market became so lucrative. A lot, of, um, a lot of disreputable breeders jumped into the market. And so they started breeding every dog they could get their hands on. And what we saw was a resurgence of hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, um, and congenital diseases, you know, bad eyes and, and can early cancers, things like that, just because everybody was breeding every dog they, they could get their hands on. So we just said, you know what, we don't want any part of that. And we knew that there are good dogs in shelters. So we started a, a program with IFAL, you know, a, a Fund for Animal Welfare, and they had a fabulous uh, video team and they came out here to Montana and um, shot videos of one of our founders, Amy Hurt, screening dogs. And, and what that allowed us to do was to crowdsource finding dogs in shelters. Because we do, there are lots of great dogs in shelters that can do um, work. But it's a rare dog that does the kind of work that we do. We screen about a thousand dogs for every one that we take. So as we started to grow, we tapped out all the shelters here in Montana and started having to look in Idaho and Wyoming and even further and further afield. And you know, we kind of got by for a while on by hook or by crook, just calling people and people who knew us and they'd say, Hey, I saw a great dog. Do you need one? And all of that. But as we grew, it got harder and harder to do that. And we wanted to make it possible for everybody to do it. So we created a program called Rescues to the Rescue. And it's still going today. And anybody anywhere in the country can, can see our, our methods for screening dogs, see how we screen a dog. They can upload the data or they can just score the dog and then call us up on the phone. Um, and, and we and everybody else can um, find these, these high drive, you know, really intense dogs that quite honestly don't make very good pets. You know, that a lot of them, that's the reason they're in the shelter in the first place is because they're super motivated, they're super drivey, super focused, and they're too much for a family. 
And so the shelters are really happy because these are problem dogs that they have a hard time adopting out. Um, and we're happy because we get, we get great, fabulous dogs. So that's our, our part of that story. My hope is that going forward, we can help others find dogs through rescues to the rescue, like the agencies, like police departments, military, everybody. And if we start expanding the different kinds of working dogs, different kinds of jobs they do, we can really start getting more and more dogs out out of shelters, you know, into the world and doing working, um, in, into working roles. So that could be really neat. That's awesome. So to bring it back to the ivory detection dogs and, and elephants yep. for a minute, you've already kind of touched about the Grimetti project and things you've seen there, but are there any other positive impacts you want to highlight um, about working dogs and elephants? Oh, tons of them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a lot of potential left to do, to do it too. So um, the Zambia dogs, I don't want to leave them out because they were the first and they've also had some very big, um, good uh, finds, you know, and, and often, you know, it's, it's a piece of a tusk and then, and then, you know, that leads to more intelligence and then they find the rest of the tusk and a few other tusks. And, and um, so they've, they've done, they've had some great impacts in both North and South Kalongwa um, as well. Um, it's always sad when they find, when they find ivory, you know, but um, but disrupting those networks is is a big deal. Um, and as wildlife crime, you know, enforcement has gotten more sophisticated, there's a lot more intelligence happening. So so that's been really great. And a lot of that is happening informally in that professional network. So the impacts are really just continuing to spread. But I'll share one that was for me was counterintuitive. I hadn't really even thought about it before, but um, early on a number of the, the projects, people knew that dogs were possible for tracking. And they said, hey, can you, um, can your dogs help us with thefts, right? Can they, can they, um, you know, somebody stole solar panels in Zambia and, and they tracked the, the thief from the building where they stole them and back to um, where he had hidden them. Um, and, and so we said, well, you know, this is not, you know, we don't do solar panel crime, we do wildlife crime. Why do you guys why are you guys doing that? And they said, because it engenders goodwill from the, from the villages. And so being able to do things like that um, and, and, and help, you know, then those the folks in the village say, hey, these are, these are our you know, friends and allies. We're gonna call them up when, when somebody's cousin from you know, another region comes to poach and, and, and you know, as they say, drop the dime on them you know, and, and, and help out with the intelligence. We did have, we, it's been a number of years now, we had a very interesting project in Myanmar with, um, with the very few forest elephants there, um, tracking them. And um, interestingly, the dogs had to go on elephant back into the national park. So there were domestic elephants, they had to ignore their scats and then collect from the wild um, elephants in, in Myanmar. That was with Simon Hedges and, and the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and it was just ecological monitoring, finding where they are, how many, you know, where they're, where they're living. So that was another neat angle. And of course, you know, I would love to see us continue and, um, and, and have, see it replicated in Asia as, um, as customs, you know, and, and transit becomes more transparent and accessible there. Um, you know, there's a lot to do there. So there's a, a lot to do in the future as well. All right. So uh, I think I know what you might answer to this, but what do you think is the greatest threat facing elephants today? Well, I think I'll answer a short term and a long term, if that's okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, I think, I think in the short term, we are not out of the woods in terms of trafficking. Um, you, you know, it, it doesn't take long for these things to ramp up. And, and we've seen that, you guys know that far, far better than I do. You know, just small changes in policies and markets can really lead to a spike, um, and so we're we're gonna we're gonna need to to stop trafficking um, and and to keep the pressure on to stop trafficking. You know, in the longer term, I do worry about about um, habitat and habitat encroachment and connectivity um, because you know elephant populations can can rebound and um, and we need to leave them space to rebound. Um, you know, after this this last constriction, this last decline that we've seen. Um, and, you know, elephants, uh, you know, I worked in Africa for 17 years and, and elephants are hard. Anybody who says it's easy to live next to elephants is, is, is not, you know, either hasn't spent much time there or isn't being totally truthful. 
um, because they're so smart, because they're so resourceful, you know? And so you can do, you can have a great conflict mitigation program. We had one in, in Raha for a while with 100% success. But part of the only reason the, that it was 100% successful was because it was really easy for the elephants to go to the next farm over. And as soon as everybody has, whether it's chili barriers or, you know, bees are using drones or whatever is new and novel, as soon as the elephants, you know, they're smart and they habituate to that stuff. And, and you know, when it's not easy to go somewhere else, then they'll run the gauntlet. So, you know, conflict and habitat, I think, are going to be with us as well. All right. So with that in mind, World Elephant Day is all about taking action for elephants. What's something everyday people can do to help elephants? Well, of course, it's to support the sanctuary and, and to support Working Dogs for Conservation and other projects who are doing that work on the ground um, to continue that. It's, it's really, really important to help um, keep, you know, keep up the effort because we, we are making great strides and, and moving forward. So that's, that's the usual one, you know, whether it's through donations or volunteering or holding an event or whatever. You know, another one is to get informed. Uh, I have been surprised at how many devoted conservationists and um, um, have, um, have, have, um, have either turned a blind eye wittingly or unwittingly to, um, to illegal, illegally traded ivory, you know, and, and someone on eBay or somewhere else says, oh, well, this is mammoth ivory, this is legal. And, and it's pretty clearly a forest elephant, you know? And um, so I think a lot of people who are enthusiasts, you know, really need to be responsible and think about what, what they're doing and, and think about all of that old ivory that's around, you know? A lot of people, we get a lot of people say, I've got this old ivory trinket or bauble or, you know, and some of them are beautiful and a lot of them aren't. <laughs> and they say, I'd love to donate it to, to, to help you train with. That's a wonderful thing to do because the more samples we can train with, the more able a dog is to generalize. So, you know, getting informed, not obviously not buying new things, not new ivory, um, but even doing constructive, helpful things with old ivory, um, that's, that's a big help. That's really great. So my last question, if people want to know more about Working Dogs for Conservation, where can they find you guys online? Thank you. Thanks for asking that. We are, um, we're online at wd4c.org, and that's the number four. So wd4c.org. We're also um, pretty active on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and you can just search for Working Dogs for Conservation or WD4C, they'll both come up. Perfect, all right. Well, thanks again for joining me on the call today. Uh, for all of you at home, if you want to continue with the World Elephant Day celebration, you can visit www.elephants.com slash World Elephant Day, where you'll find family activities, crafts, and more ways to take action for elephants. Thanks, Pete. Thank you for being a great partner and thanks for having us.